Hello, welcome back to the Tech Theater Skills series. My name is Chris Schlemp, and I've been an actor, director, projections designer, and teacher for over 20 years. I'm glad to be sharing some of my knowledge with you. This series is all about sound design and is intended for someone who is just beginning their voyage of discovery into the world of sound in the theater. The sound design series will be broken up into seven parts, and this is episode one, Mining the Script, where we will be taking a look at how sound designers begin their process of creating a unique soundscape for a new production of a play. Time to get out a pen and notebook. Watching and listening are great ways to encounter a new topic, but you really make it your own by engaging with the material, writing down what you hear, and trying things out for yourself. The more you can connect your eyes, ears, hand, and brain, the more likely you are to learn. We will begin by taking a field trip to the Northwest United States to visit an old friend of mine. Professor Craig Miller is the head of directing and assistant professor of acting and directing at the University of Idaho. Before he held that position, he was the artistic director of the Sixth Street Playhouse, one of the prominent theater companies in the community where I live and teach in Santa Rosa, California. Professor Miller has directed me in several productions over the years and has also been the sound designer on numerous productions. I thought he would be a perfect guest speaker to kick off this series on sound design. My name is Craig Miller, and I am an assistant professor of theater, acting and directing, and also the head of directing at the University of Idaho. I'm also the former artistic director at Sixth Street Playhouse there in Santa Rosa, and uh, a few years ago had the opportunity to work with many of the students at Montgomery High School. I wanna say a special thank you to Mr. Schlemp for inviting me to be part of this technical skills series that he's put together for you, um, specifically talking today about sound design. And in this segment, what we're gonna be talking about is how do we mine the script for all of the clues and cues for the sounds that we need to create in order to tell our story. Remember that all disciplines of design are storytellers. They're all storytelling disciplines, right? That's what we do in the theater, whether we're directors or actors or sound designers or scenic designers, costume designers, what have you. Everyone in the theater is a storyteller. And in sound, we have the opportunity to tell very distinct stories. Today, what I'm gonna share with you is a chunk of uh, stage direction from a, um, a script of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens that was adapted by Michael Wilson. Now, this is a script that I directed and produced two seasons in a row at Sixth Street Playhouse. And uh, I really love this version of the script, but there is um, some wonderful stage direction that comes at the top of scene three, right before the entrance of the ghost of Jacob Marley. Some of you might not be familiar with the story of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. So I have put a quick summary of the story for you, borrowed from the Royal Shakespeare Company's recent production material down in the description below. Read it for a quick refresher. Okay, back to the lesson. What we're going to do is we're gonna look at those stage directions and we're gonna talk about what should we be looking for in these stage directions that lead us to some of the decisions that we're going to make about the sounds that we either need to pull from digital recorded sound that already exists, or perhaps we have to actually record ourselves and actually make sound uh, that we're going to be using that is specific to our production. Okay, but let's just read through this real quick uh, for, for our uh, reading enjoyment first, right? Uh, designers read the script many, many times. And usually the first time a director, designers, we're gonna read the script for pleasure the first time through. So let's just do that right now. So scene three, upstairs in Scrooge's house, his bedchamber. And here's the stage direction. Scrooge, entering his bedchamber, leaving the door ajar, throws his coat on the bed and slumps into his armchair, weary from a long day of counting money and dashing spirits. He starts to drift off to sleep when suddenly there is a voice on the wind outside his window. It seems to beckon Scrooge to see who or what it might be. He crosses to the window. As soon as he reaches the window, the door to his bedchamber slams closed behind him with a ferocity, almost sounding like terrible thunder, turning Scrooge on his heels. Then, as if by its own volition, the servant bell pole next to his bed begins to jiggle and dance, ringing a bell in some distant room off the of the house. 
Next, the mantel clock begins to chime, then the grandfather clock, then many clocks and bells, hundreds of them. There is a maddening cacophony of bells that sends Scrooge diving to hide under his coat on the bed. At once, it stops as if the sound has been sucked into a vacuum and is slowly replaced with a low rumble that shakes the floors, the walls, the whole house, and Scrooge to the core of his being. As he slowly peers out from his ridiculous hiding place, suddenly a brilliant shaft of light shoots skyward, emanating from the floorboards, which suddenly explode open, making way for a ghoulish, ghostly apparition who seemingly rises from the mouth of hell itself. Drenched and dripping in a thousand pounds of locks and chains, ledgers, cash boxes, and deeds, all cast in steel, tethering him to the underworld. It is the ghost of Jacob Marley. Scrooge speaks, how now? What do you want with me? Marley's ghost, much. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments section below. Or if you happen to be in my class, type them in the chat. Let's see if we can find the answers together. Professor Miller is about to show you all the treasures he mined from those stage directions. But before he reveals his discoveries, why don't you try it out for yourself first? When I get done giving you directions, pause the video and see how many sounds you can find. Here's a quick tip for you. Not all sounds will be obvious at first because they will seem more like visuals, like something you would see instead of hear. Just remember that we can see and hear at the same time, and it is often the case that the sound is more believable than the visual, at least on stage. Okay, pause the video, and when you are done mining, resume playing to compare your treasures with Professor Miller's. Let's now take a look at the things we should be looking for in the script that lead us to some of the things that we know we're going to need to choose in order to tell this story as the playwright had intended it or as we might want to. Now, one of the things that I like to do is I like to set the scene. So we, we know we're coming into a scene out of a previous scene. So I'm going, to make a, I'm going to make just a decision that doesn't have anything to do with the stage direction as written. And, and that is I'm going to put us, I'm going to clearly put us in London, okay, and by doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the sound of Big Ben uh, chiming off in the distance, right? That's going to that's going to help us get into Scrooge's house and up to the bedchamber. That's going to be that kind of sound connective tissue that drives us from the scene on the street up into his house, right? So we read it again now, but this time we're looking for things that might, are, that are going to um, help us make decisions in our uh, design choices. So Scrooge entering his bedchamber, leaving the door ajar, throws his coat on the bed and slumps into his armchair, weary from a day a long day of counting money and dashing spirits. Not a whole lot there, right? Okay. He starts to drift off to sleep when suddenly there is a voice on the wind outside his window. Okay. There's the first one. Suddenly there is a voice on the wind outside his window, right? It seems to beckon Scrooge to see who or what it might be. Not a lot there. He's getting up. That's going to be a visual cue. He crosses to the window. As soon as he reaches the window, the door to his bedchamber slams closed behind him with ferocity, almost sounding like terrible thunder. That's all, that's all story that can be told by sound, right? Now, we're probably going to visually see the door slam, but we can augment that and we can support that, watching that door on stage slam by adding sound to the actual physical activity of that door slamming by itself turning Scrooge on his heels. Then, as if by its own volition, the servant bell next to his bed begins to jiggle and dance, ringing a bell in some distant room of the house. All right, so we're gonna hear a little chimey bell off in the distance in the house. Next, the mantel clock begins to chime, then the grandfather clock, and then many clocks and bells, hundreds of them. There is a maddening cacophony of bells. Right? We've got our work cut out for us here. We've got to layer all kinds of different sounds of bells that we're probably going to find in our search on iTunes or it maybe in, a, in, in, in some sort of online uh, directory that can help us, that will charge us probably a, a fee for using this sound, but our ASCAP license at the theater will cover the use of that sound so that we can legally use it, right? That sends Scrooge diving under his coat to the bed. Once it stops, at once, it stops. That, there it is. As 
if the sound had been sucked into a vacuum and is slowly replaced with a low rumble, right? So we have sound stopping. It sounds like it's been sucked by a vacuum and it's replaced by a low rumble, okay? That shakes the floor, the walls, the whole house and Scrooge to the core of his being. He slowly peers out from his ridiculous hiding place. Suddenly a brilliant shaft of light shoots skyward emanating from the floorboards, which suddenly explode open, making way for a ghoulish ghostly apparition now, we can, we can have all kinds of artistic license fun with what does a ghoulish, ghostly apparition moving into this space sound like, and we're going to make some of those choices, right? And then he is drenched and dripping in a thousand pounds of locks and chains, ledger, ledgers, cash boxes, deeds, all cast in steel, tethering him to the underworld. Now, obviously, the costume designer is not going to make a decision to put the actor playing Jacob Marley in a thousand pounds of locks and chains. They're going to be made out of plastic. They're going to be very light, but they're going to look heavy, right? But we can help tell that story of how much and how, how, how they're made of steel through some choices that we can make in the sound. Wow, that was quite a number of sounds. How many did you find? In a future episode, we will actually listen to the sounds that Professor Miller created for that very scene. For now, you have already learned a lot. You got to take a field trip to the University of Idaho. You learned how to mine a script for all the sound possibilities embedded inside. And you got to work through a practical example from an actual play. I want to thank my friend, Professor Craig Miller, for being a guest teacher for this episode, and also photographer Eric Chazankin, who graciously gave me permission to use his production stills from the Sixth Street Playhouse's 2016 production of A Christmas Carol. Links are in the description below if you want to investigate further. Finally, I want to thank you for stopping by today to learn a little about sound design. If you enjoyed what you learned, please feel free to like and subscribe. The next episode will be available shortly, so I look forward to continuing this journey with you real soon.